All right, welcome. This is Mike Adams of Brighton.com and Brighton.tv. And today we have a very important interview. First time guest, but someone that I think many of you are very familiar with. And I think his voice is critical for our time. His name is Scott Ritter. That's right. The Scott Ritter, former UN weapons inspector, United States Marine Corps officer, and now an author and analyst. And he has been making waves uh, with his commentary and analysis and also a few enemies along the way which we'll get to, but he joins us now to cover the latest news about Russia, Ukraine, NATO, Nord Stream, and the U.S. State Department. Mr. Scott Ritter, sir, uh, welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you on. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the, the privilege is all mine. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, we, we really honor what you're doing and your presence here and your courage. And, and uh, I don't say this often, but I'm actually a fan of, of your current work. I listen to a lot of your interviews and videos. And so um, and people say this to me sometimes, but I, I may know you more than you know me because I hear about, you know, your, your passion for football and things you do in the off hours and your dogs and so on. Uh, so just thank you for being the real deal, you know, for being authentic in what you do. We appreciate you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, you don't get any more real than, uh, than this. Uh, I'm uh, a little disheveled, uh, unshaven, uh, but you know, it is what it is. This is what happens when you're a, a citizen activist and you're not backed by uh, corporate media or anything like that. So uh, thank you again for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in in fact, let, let's just start with the big, big picture, if we could, because you have been, I think many people would characterize you as a, a dissenting voice against, of course, the, the establishment narrative, which we all know is uh, just an incredible tapestry of fiction weaving by the State Department. But if you were, if someone were walking in new to this conversation, like what's going on in Ukraine and Russia and what happened to Nord Stream? How would you summarize where we are right now, if you could? Uh, a quick summary would be that the, um, the United States uh, since uh, 1992 has treated Russia as a defeated enemy. Uh, of course, Russia being uh, the successor uh, state to the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, we had sought to keep them down. Um, we succeeded in doing that for 10 years under Boris Yeltsin. A new president came in, Vladimir Putin, who wasn't going to play that game. Uh, and we've been trying to get rid of Putin ever since. And uh, we do that by trying to destabilize Russia. And one of the key aspects of uh, destabilizing Russia was to expand NATO to Russia's border, uh, to include uh, stripping away Ukraine from a Russian sphere of uh, influence, knowing that this would uh, provoke a, a confrontation with Russia. And now we have the fight. Um, it's a fight we thought we could win by uh, sanctioning Russia, uh, bringing about the economic destruction of Russia, uh, and therefore creating the conditions for the people of Russia to rise up and remove Putin from power. We miscalculated. Uh, the Russians actually flipped the script. Uh, their um, their economy is doing well um, and getting better. Uh, Europe's economy, on the other hand, isn't doing well. And the last time I went to the supermarket and looked at energy prices, we're, uh, we got some issues uh, too. There's also a shooting war on the ground. We, uh, we've we turned what was a Russian-Ukrainian regional conflict into a uh, existential battle of survival between Russia and the collective West, the United States, NATO, and some uh, non-NATO European countries. Uh, who are using Ukraine as a proxy uh, to fight Russia. And um, surprise, surprise, we're not doing well in that either. Uh, you know, it's a, a year into the conflict. Um, and the fact is the Russians have mobilized successfully. They have positioned their military on the battlefield in a manner which um, will lead to victory over Ukraine, a, a Ukraine that has been propped up by the United States taxpayer dollar, by NATO weaponry. Um, in brief, uh, people say, well, how could you be so confident? Uh, what, I'll, what I'll say is this. Uh, this war is, is very complex, but it, it, by and large, it's a war that's defined by field artillery. Uh, that's the number one killer of people. And the side that has the most guns that can fire the most shells in the most accurate manner is going to be the side that's going to win. Russia is that side. But more importantly, uh, the Ukrainians who received a tremendous amount of artillery support from the United States and, and NATO, uh, they're running out of ammunition and they will run out of ammunition this summer. And because they've depleted NATO stocks, there's nothing left to give them. And we don't have a mobilized defense industry to build uh, or produce new ammunition. So they're literally 
they're done. Uh, this summer, if they don't find additional resources to, to provide ammunition, when the guns stop firing, the war is over. And um, the yeah, Ukrainian we, guns look like they're going to stop firing, and the Russian guns will never stop firing. Okay, you, we've got so many issues uh, from, from what you just <laughs> said there. I took a few notes. Uh, but, but let me just get this out of the way uh, at, at the front. Is it is it fair to characterize your position as essentially anti-war in the sense that you don't want people to die. You don't you don't want conflict. You want a negotiated peace of some kind. Is that is that a fair characterization? I, I would modify it as such. Uh, first of all, I'm a Marine. Um, war is my business. Right. So if you want a war, I'll give you a war. Uh, if you want to die, I'll kill you. Um, I have no problem with this. So I'm not anti-war. OK, I, I, I did a tweet. It got me in a lot of trouble, but I'll, I'll it, it roughly <laughs> another one. <laughs> my position. What I said is um, I'm a dog owner and I love dogs and I would never want to bring harm to dogs. If I find a stray dog, I'm going to take it in. I'm going to take it to a shelter. I'm going to care for it. But if there's a rabid dog in the street, it needs to be shot. And uh, we need Atticus Finch, who is the lawyer from To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, the World War I veteran sharpshooter who came out and shot a rabid dog in the streets. Um, and that's my position. And I view Ukraine as a rabid dog, and I view Russia as Atticus Finch. So even though I'm anti-war and I would prefer a negotiated settlement, let's never forget that the Ukrainian government has embraced the ideology of Stepan Bandera, a uh, ultra-nationalist who uh, fought alongside Adolf Hitler's Third Reich, uh, has the blood of tens of thousands of Jews on his hands, hundreds of thousands of Poles, hundreds of thousands of Russians. Um, and he is the national hero of, of Volodymyr Zelensky's Ukraine today. My uncle fought in World War II. I have other relatives that fought in World War II. They fought against the Nazi threat. And so I'm not going to sit by and pretend that there's some sort of equilibrium between the Russians and the Ukrainians today in Ukraine. This is actually a war between good and evil, and evil is defined by the odious neo-Nazi ideology of the Zelensky government. And um, while I don't agree so, with everything Russia does on this side, they're on the right side of history. So I can't say I'm anti-war. What I am is, um, you know, I would prefer that a peaceful solution could be found to these uh, to these problems. I would well, prefer and, and that war didn't break out. But a that, rabid dog is running in the streets, and uh, I'd prefer he didn't have rabies. But now that he does, he needs to be put down. Okay, all right. Th thank you for that clarification, because, you know, your the history of the work that you've done for the United States of America as, as a U.N. weapons inspector, I mean, at least my understanding is you helped negotiate some of the key treaties that probably prevented Western Europe from being hit by nuclear weapons over the last several decades. And so in a sense, your efforts, and, and you were really critical in this, is, is my understanding, but you can speak to it, your efforts helped secure the peace by preventing war in Europe. And now a lot of that's just being thrown away at this point because of the State Department and the interactions. But go, go ahead and speak to that if you would, please, sir. No, I look again, uh, I'm somebody who understands the the uh, awful reality of war. And um, and therefore, I want to ensure that we do everything human po humanly possible to prevent war, that war should be the absolute last option, that we should exhaust every possibility short of war before we make the awful decision to go to war. Because to me, what war stands for is dead Marines. And as a Marine officer, my number one responsibility is the lives of the Marines that the American people have entrusted to me. So the last thing I want is dead Marines. The last thing I want to do is put my Marines in harm's way for a cause that's not worthy of the sacrifice we're asking them to make. Um, and so this is why I am such an advocate for peaceful solutions. I believe firmly that old men should yak, 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 yak until they're exhausted. Nobody dies when old men or old women yak, yak, yak. Uh, but when they stop yakking and they hand guns off to the young people and they start shooting each other, then we have a problem. Now, again, if there's rabid dogs out there, give the guns to the ones who can take the rabid dog down. I have no problem with that. But we cannot view using the military as the first option, the option of first resort. You know, war isn't Hollywood. We have a whole generation of people that have grown up believing in, you know, video games, Call of Duty, uh, Medal of Honor. I guess there's some better ones out there nowadays. I don't know. But, um, you know, when you die in those, you get to hit reset, you come back up and you go, hey, that was cool. Right. I, there's no reset button in war. When you're dead, you're dead. When the arm's gone, it's gone. When the brain's addled, it's addled. Um, there's no recovery from that. 
So we need to understand the awful cost of war, the awful reality of war, and make sure it doesn't happen unless it's absolutely necessary, the absolute last recourse to a problem that if we don't solve it, will manifest itself in a direct threat to the American people. And so this is why I have spent the best part of my adult life working to come up with solutions to conflict. Look, I fought in Desert Storm. Um, and so I know that there are times when, um, you know, there, there are no solutions and you have to, you, you, you have to unleash the uh, dogs of war. And then, um, then you do what you do. And war is an ugly business. There's nothing pretty about it. There's nothing glamorous about it. It's an ugly business. But then you get it done. And then you pick yourself up and you try and move forward in a manner that builds on the horrible tragedy of what's occurred in a positive fashion to prevent future wars. And this is what I've been doing. I did it as a weapons inspector in the Soviet Union to try and prevent nuclear conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, successfully. And then I did it uh, in the aftermath of Desert Storm, uh, trying to disarm Iraq of weapons of mass destruction so there wouldn't be a recurrence of conflict. And I ran into a problem with my government because they didn't want Iraq disarmed. They wanted Saddam Hussein gone, and they were using this process to get rid of Saddam. Um, and they wanted to tell lies about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction to justify the 2003 invasion. So I uh, right. at, at one I point, took, didn't uh, they actually uh, send you in to a facility and say that your job is to find weapons there, illegal weapons, even if they don't exist or something along those lines? Yeah. In, in, in March of 1998, um, after meetings in the White House and the State Department, uh, a team that I was the, the, the chief inspector of leading uh, was dispatched to Iraq to the Iraqi Minister of De Ministry of Defense. That's like going to the Pentagon. And they wanted me to inspect the Minister of Defense's office. That's like going to the Secretary of Defense office. Now imagine a scenario where Iraqi inspectors show up outside the Pentagon. Hey, boss, we want to come in and inspect the uh, Secretary of Defense office. We wouldn't let them in. We'd say no. Um, and the Iraqis said, if you try to inspect the Ministry of Defense, it's a red line, it'll be war. So this was a deliberate provocation by the United States to use inspection teams to provoke the conditions for a war with Iraq. Unfortunately for the United States, um, I'm somebody who, you know, uh, believed that our job as a UN weapons inspector was to implement the United Nations mandate of uh, legitimate arms control through verification. And I was able to negotiate entry into the Ministry of Defense with the Iraqi officials. And I'm talking about the most senior people in Iraq. Um, and, and we did this because they trusted me. They didn't, they didn't like me because I was a son of you-know-what. My nickname was Abu Azamat, father of all crises. I was oh, the yeah. bad guy. I was the guy that came <laughs> in and there was always a problem. But I was always honest with them. And they knew that I was doing my, the, the mandate I was given and nothing more. So when I told them, trust me, if you don't let me in, there's going to be a war. The only right. way you avoid this war is you have to let me in and you have to let me do my job without any interference. And um, after a couple hours of back and forth, they finally agreed to let me in on my terms, on my conditions. And we carried out the inspection. We found nothing. Um, and we stopped the war. And after that, I've been called an enemy of, uh, of, of, of the state by American officials. Sandy Berger yeah, called but, me. But um, critically, sorry to interrupt, but. At that point, when you found nothing, didn't the intelligence community at that time sort of wink and a nod? They wanted you to find something, right? The, didn't, didn't they kind of say, they, you they need to find to something? Blocked. They wanted me to get blocked. The oh, they wanted you to get blocked get... so they could say, okay. So they could say the they're hiding something. Got yeah, it. The idea was that I was going to go in because the Iraqis had said, we will never let inspectors into this building, ever, ever. Okay. So the idea was for me to go there, get blocked. And then we could say they won't let them in because they're hiding something. Got and it. then they would launch the attack. I screwed that whole plan up by getting in the building and doing the detailed inspection. And, and I didn't know what the outcome would be. If there was something there, I would have found it. Right. I would have. I'm that good. My team was that good. But uh, we got in and we didn't find anything. And we issued that report. And in doing so, we prevented a war. And at that time, I thought I had thought I'd done a great thing. Uh, but my government called me a traitor, um, and, and that was the beginning or the end of my relationship with the U.S. government. Right. So that was the turning point where then you became the – well, or they, they condemned you as the enemy, I guess, of, of – that was the Bush administration. Uh, Clinton. At, Clinton oh, that, administration. Oh, okay, that was Clinton at that time, which then became Bush, but they, they, yeah. they never changed their stance on, on you from that point, correct? No. And certainly not I, today. I think, 
I've been a bad guy ever since then, apparently. Okay, my. And then now you've been added to the, um, uh, what is this, the Ukraine? You're, you're number one, Scott. You're number one on a list of, <laughs> yeah, you, you've reached the number one status, which is always uh, an important milestone. But tell us about uh, that list. Well, there's, there's, there's actually two lists, and you don't want to be on either of them. One is the uh, Center for Countering Disinformation, a unique uh, name, uh, because it's a purely propaganda outlet uh, of the office of the president in, uh, in Ukraine. So they work directly for Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, and this is an office that was created by the U.S. State Department, actually, funded by U.S. taxpayers. And um, they, they take anybody who speaks out in a manner that opposes the narrative being pushed by the Ukrainian government, by the U.S. government, uh, by mainstream media. If you dare challenge this, then you get put on this list. It's a blacklist. Uh, they call you a Russian propagandist. They call you an information terrorist. They call you a war criminal. And the idea is to, um, to have you canceled meaning uh, by lab- by making this label, the idea is for you to be blacklisted and not not allowed on uh, any media outlets, et cetera. Um, they've also called for my arrest, but uh, fortunately the U.S. government hasn't decided to act on that yet. But, but this, is, and this people... is the list I'm number one on, but there's another list yeah. uh, called Mir Tvoritz. It's the, uh, the, 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 the world traveler list. Uh, this is the uh, list run by the Ukrainian intelligence service, and it's a hit list. If you're on your if you're on this list, you're marked to die. And, and, and some people killed. have been killed on that. They list. They have actually killed people. And yeah. When they do, they put a red line through saying liquidated. So they're wow. bragging about doing this. And so I'm on this list. Uh, a number of Americans are on this list. And the U.S. government's doing nothing about it. Literally nothing about it. We are being marked for death for exercising our constitutional right of free speech. You know, you don't have to agree with me. A lot of people don't. And that's OK. That's what makes America great. We disagree. We can have a debate, a dialogue, a discussion, or we can't. It's up to you. I don't care. Um, but we're exercising our constitutional right of free speech. Uh, you should not be condemned to die for doing that which you are permitted under your constitution. And you should not be condemned to die in an organization that's supported by the U.S. government and funded by U.S. taxpayer. That's an that's an indirect way of avoiding the First Amendment uh, prohibition against Congress passing laws that abridge the free speech of Americans. Uh, Congress, well, in this case, didn't pass a law, but they passed a budget giving money to the Ukrainians so they can stifle free speech by threatening me and my family with death. And this, it's something this is we have the, to live with every day of the week. Absolutely, yeah. And But this is a critical issue that, that affects you and many other Americans uh, including people like myself as well. You know, I've, I've been blacklisted off every platform you can imagine. That's why I had to build this platform, Brighton. I had to build it because I, they wouldn't let me on any platform whatsoever. But of course, they didn't like me talking about big pharma. For you, it's, uh, you know, geopolitics and the State Department and, and war and so on. But for me, it was big pharma and vaccines. But a couple of key issues here. You're being, they, they want to silence you not because the things that you say are are totally insane and make no sense, although obviously some people could disagree with your, you know, your characterizations of Zelensky or what have you. And that's fine. Like you said, disagreement is OK. But when you talk about Nord Stream, when you talk about the lack of munitions, when you talk about the expansion of NATO, these are all factual things that actually make a lot of sense with a lot of people. And it's it's as if the State Department just wants to silence you because your questions make so much sense about those issues. What do you think about that angle? No, that's 100 percent correct. I'll show you the uh, the absurdity of, of this. Um, <clears throat> back when they formed this list in July of um, of, uh, of last year, 2022, um, yeah, I was one of the first people put on the list. And my number one crime, uh, they listed at that time three. I think right now I've got about six uh things that I'm accused of doing. But uh, the number one thing I was accused of doing back then was to call the conflict a proxy conflict between NATO and Russia. Which is now admitted by State Department. Not just the State Department. The the, the Ukraine (laughs) Minister of Defense has come out and openly said, no, this is a proxy conflict between Ukraine and between NATO and Russia. And Ukraine is the is the middleman. I was just telling the truth back when I said this first back in March. Um, But back then, that was an inconvenient narrative that you couldn't put forward. Now, situations change. So I'm expecting the Minister of Defense to be right alongside me on this list. 
you know, because we both believe the same thing. I well, will right. say this. You, but you, you put, said it. You said it first, which is your crime. <laughs> you said it first. But you see, it uh, same, right. same thing happened to me. When, when COVID came out, I said, of course, that came out of a lab in China, in Wuhan. Of course it did. And, and, and for three years, you know, you're censored. You're called a conspiracy theorist. And then now the U.S. Department of Energy comes out and says, yeah, it came out of Wuhan. And the FBI says, yeah, it came out of Wuhan. Well, so, so Scott, your crime is the same as my crime. We're ahead of our time. It's Be the, the ahead of time, time crime. Yeah, because I, uh, you know, I, I, they've been accused of other things. For instance, uh, people have taken umbrage over my characterization of the Bucha massacre that, uh, you know, that's alleged to have taken place in, um, in the first days of April of last year. But all I've said is that um, when you have a Ukrainian government official uh, going on social media, warning people to stay indoors and don't worry about the shooting, that there's cleansing operations taking place. When you have the Ukrainian intelligence service uh, put out on their webpage, uh, the unit, the safari unit, will be doing cleansing operations, targeting collaborators, um, and uh, and bragging about it. And then you have a videotape of this safari unit in Bucha, where the people are saying, "Hey, look, he's got a white armband, or he's not wearing a blue arm gam. Can we shoot them?" And the answer is yes, shoot them. When you take all of that, and the end result is bodies on the ground wearing white armbands, signifying some sort of sympathy to Russia, holding Russian, um, you know, uh, ration packs, uh, thereby meeting the definition of collaborator, you have a very strong circumstantial case that the Ukrainian government was was involved. And this is what I wrote. I said, if there's going to be investigation, uh, we need to do a forensic evaluation of the bodies. We need to determine time of death, mechanism of death. We need somebody to go through the bodies and look at the angle of the bullet wounds, uh, the type of round fired, because the Ukrainians use a different, uh, a different, uh, you know, round than the than the than the Russians. So, a good forensic examination of these bodies while they're fresh will tell you exactly who was responsible. And I firmly believe it was the Ukrainians. But then these bodies were cleaned up, buried, disposed of in a manner that uh, you know basically uh, corrupted the evidence. And suddenly everybody's coming out saying, Russia did it, Russia did it, Russia did it. I'm guilty of asking questions. I'm guilty of connecting the dots. I'm guilty of putting forward a fact-based uh, you know, assessment of the situation that I believe will stand the test of time. But it certainly is inconvenient to the Ukrainians and the Americans and everybody else who has uh, gone down that path. And there, I can well, co- go over and over and over again with these uh, – yeah, another one I was guilty of, um, you, you, I'm a ballistic missile expert, supposedly. I've done a little bit of work in ballistic missiles in the Soviet Union and Iraq. Um, so I know them, and I know how to investigate uh, things that deal with the ballistic missiles. So when in uh, April, a, uh, a, a Tochka U, which is a specific kind of a missile, uh, landed in Kramatorsk, a city next to a train station, killing a bunch of women and children who were ready, getting ready to be evacuated, the Ukrainians immediately said, the Russians did it. The Russians did it. And I'm looking at it going, well, first of all, from an order of battle perspective, only the Ukrainians have the Tochka U. So we got a problem right now. If you're telling me the Russians suddenly brought them out of retirement, that's a different issue. But when we do basic uh, analysis of the debris, you know, the missile flies on a given path. When it lands, the warhead separates, then the missile body separates. So the impact crater will be ahead of the missile body. So where the missile uh, the body is, and where the crater is, you can draw a line that'll take you straight back in the direction that it was fired from, and it goes straight back to Ukrainian territory. Um, and then you look at the serial number, and you determine the batch when it was made, and the contract where it was delivered, and that serial number is linked to Tochka U missiles delivered to the Ukrainian military. So all the forensic data screams this was a Ukrainian attack, and yet I'm a Russian propagandist for daring to point well, that out. Well, yeah, I mean, Scott, your crime is believing in facts. I mean, that that's in our society today. You can't dare uh, believe in facts. You have to follow the propaganda. But, you know, the, the best skill of the West is projection, you know, projecting their their tactics, their false flags, perhaps uh, their their crimes upon the enemy. Now, I, you know, I have no doubt, though, by the way, for the record and, and you know, you you might berate me for this, but I have no doubt that there are certainly some some war crimes that have been carried out by certain segments of Russian troops as well. And I think it happens in every war. It happened in Vietnam Those with help. American troops. But in the big picture, I have seen a lot of, of cases where uh, 
the Ukrainian leadership, Zelensky, is blaming Russia for things that clearly were carried out by Zelensky. And, and so, that, I mean, it's obvious at this point. It's projection. No, there, there's no doubt about it. Look, again, war is hell and people are people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the United States Marine Corps. I believe that we train all of our Marines to a high ethical standard. Uh, we have solid leadership. Uh, we have solid Marines. But uh, when humans are subjected to the pressures of combat, um, uh, sometimes uh, mistakes are made, and sometimes those mistakes are criminal in nature. One only has to take a look at uh, what happened in Haditha, Iraq, where Marines were involved in the murder of Iraqi civilians, um, a war crime, um, to, to realize that every military is capable of uh, these mistakes. What, what separates these militaries from uh, you know, others is the ability to recognize a crime was committed to carry out the appropriate investigation and to hold those who perpetrated the crime accountable for what was done. Um, if Russians have committed uh, war crimes, and I believe there's no doubt in my mind that Russians have done uh, the things that could constitute war crimes in Ukraine, my firm belief is that the Russian government, uh, the Russian military, has arrested these people and prosecuted these people um, because it's not the official policy of the Russian government to perpetrate war crimes. And there's so much uh, evidence to prove this point. Uh, but you know, the Ukrainians, on the other hand, film their soldiers executing Russian prisoners of war. Uh, they film well, their let's... soldiers executing civilians. They film their soldiers torturing people. Um, and they do it without remorse because they view the Russians as subhumans. Yeah, that's, uh, they that's call true. Them forms, they, they do you know? that. But let's, in, in, let, let's expand this war crimes discussion to the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline. So, and, and, and I've said, and I think, I think you concur with this conclusion, although some people obviously uh, differ with this, the State Department differs, but it looks like to me it's, it's compelling with Cy Hirsch's article, the evidence, and frankly, we arrived at this conclusion before his article, long before, but the United States, essentially the U.S. Navy divers set this up and they detonated the Nord Stream pipelines that served Germany primarily. So here we have an act of infrastructure terrorism against a NATO ally. Now, Russia's not doing that. Russia didn't blow up their own Gazprom pipeline. Russia isn't destroying the infrastructure of Belarus, for example, but the US is destroying the infrastructure of Germany, and then there's this massive cover-up. Uh, that's, that's the craziest thing. I mean, this is, this is history, like a dark history unfolding. What are your thoughts on, on Nord Stream and US terrorism against its own allies? No, I mean, it's exactly that. Um, I think uh, most observers were struck on uh, February 7th of last year when um, the president of the United States, in the presence of Olaf Scholz, the uh, chancellor of, uh, of, of Germany, uh, in, a, in a White House uh, press conference, straight up said, if Russian tanks enter Ukraine, uh, we're going to shut down Nord Stream 2. It won't exist anymore. And, it, and the, it wasn't the German chancellor who went, well, time out. That's sort of like our infrastructure. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, you know, th I reject this. If this happens, this will be an act of war. He was just silent. L I mean, literally a scared boy look on his face. It took a German reporter to stand up and say, hey, are, are, are you saying you're going to attack? How could you do that? It's German infrastructure. The I remember that. It'll, yeah. it'll be done. Right. That's a confession. That's a, that is a confession. a confession. Yeah. And um, so... You know, there's people in prison who have been convicted on weaker circumstantial cases than the one you can make about American complicity in, in this attack. We have a confession from the president of the United States. We have Tony Blinken, because one of the big questions that has to be asked is, cui bono, who benefits? And Tony Blinken, the secretary of state, instead of coming out and saying, oh, my God, this is horrible. Uh, Germany, what can we do to help? I mean, you've just lost critical energy infrastructure. We're going to investigate. We're going to find the perpetrator. We're going to help bring justice. His first words were, this creates a tremendous opportunity for the United States to supplant. So you're just sitting there going, so you benefit from this. That's a problem. And then there has to be the means. Where's the murder weapon? Well, good Lord, you have Baltic Ops 22 doing a mine, <laughs> doing underwater mine clearing, uh, deep diver exercises right where the pipelines are. That's the murder weapon. So even before Cy Hirsch wrote his outstanding article, um, it was a strong circumstantial case. And then you have everybody covering it up. I mean, you know, the Swedes go in, have the initial contact with the crime scene, clean it up, 
and then they seal the file and say, we're never talking about this because it has national security implications. What? You think if the Swedes has evidence that Russia did this, they wouldn't be screaming about it from every... They know who did it. They know America did it. Yeah. The, Dan the Danes went in, cleaned it up. The Brits went in, cleaned it up. You know, the only people not investigating are the Germans. They, they just don't see no here, here, you know, here, they're saying they don't want to do anything because they know what the ramifications of this is. It's, uh, they do. You they cannot do. be a NATO member if you've been stabbed in the back this way. But but <laughs> Scott, um, I don't know how much you've been tracking this, but, you know, my my area of expertise is food and the food supply. I've had a lot on a lot of guests about this. And a story appeared recently that in the United Kingdom, they're shutting down they're, or they're, they're not using greenhouses that they would normally use at this time of year in order to pre-grow crops that are going to become you know, vegetables for grocery stores. So, and, and why aren't they running the greenhouses? Because they, they can't afford the energy. Why? Because Nord Stream was blown up and it affected all of Western Europe. So now we have, it's not just energy for industry, right? Uh, the, the metal smelting operations, the, the manufacturing, the automobiles, everything, glass manufacturing in France shut down. It's not just that, it's energy for food and also that natural gas gets converted into, you know, ammonia and then urea and then nitrogen-based fertilizers. And so the fertilizer plants are shut down. And so now we're entering the spring planting season of 2023 in Europe and they don't have the greenhouses and they don't have much in the way of fertilizer. So fast forward to the summer or the fall, there's going to be a lot of hungry, damn, you know, angry Europeans because of the Nord Stream destruction. And nobody in the media is covering the fact that Europeans will starve because America blew that thing up. But that's the truth. No, you're 100% you're, you're correct. Um, if, but what's amazing is um, that the Europeans aren't even – I mean, the only country where I see people waking up is Germany. Uh, they have some very brave uh, members of parliament who are standing up and demanding an investigation – uh, literally pointing a finger at Olaf Scholz and his his government saying, what are you doing about this? We were attacked. This was an act of terrorism. This was an act of war. What are you doing about it? Why are you silent? Why aren't you investigating? Um, and I, you know, I look, I'm, I'm, it's not a secret. I'm, I'm very good friends with Cy Hirsch. Um, I've known him for 25 years. And um, I, I've had uh, a lot of conversations with him about this article after it came out. And I told him straight up, I said, Cy, you wrote the most important article um, this century, and it may be the most important article of the century, because what you have exposed is a crime by an American president. Now, American presidents commit crimes all the time, but this is a crime against an ally. This is a violation of the Constitution conspiring with your cabinet to carry out an attack against the NATO ally without notifying Congress. You've exposed an act of war by the United States against an ostensible ally and a friend. Um, and if Germany wakes up, this is the end of NATO. This is the end of the European Union. This is the end of a lot of things because Germany cannot be a member of a military alliance that allows the most powerful member of that alliance to carry out an act of terrorism, an act of aggression, to stab them, to carry out an economic Pearl Harbor. Um, and this means the end of the European Union. Germany has the most powerful economy uh, in, in Europe. If they fall out, the, the euro collapses. This could change everything because one senile narcissist in the White House decided that he needed a made-for-TV moment where he could look up. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and I think, I think your pets there agree with you as well. Um, kind, of, kind of outraged, uh, as we all are. But, you know, the truth is that I think you're right. This is a major turning point because it, it, it begins the accelerated deindustrialization of Europe. You know, we're seeing the shutdown of BASF out of Germany. They're moving operations to China. Why? Because Nord Stream was blown up. They can't get the natural gas that they need. They need the hydrocarbons as raw materials to make, what is it, 45,000 chemicals for medicine, textiles, industry, fertilizer, everything. That's shutting down, folks. How is Western Europe going to come back from this? And then let's talk about munitions as well. Uh, I think a lot of our readers were shocked to learn, uh, I forgot which official it was out of the UK, like a former military official there said that if the UK goes to war with Russia, the UK will last about one week and then they're done. They, they don't have any more ammunition for that. And the US is running out of ammunition because they're sending it all to Ukraine. And you know, what about the German uh, uh, military operation? Not very deep anymore either. You know, 
They're sending makeshift tanks or, or promising to, not even getting them there. Uh, we'll send them into the future. You know, we'll get you tanks in 2026, that, that kind of thing. Talk about the industry that's backing or the lack of industry at this point in the West and what that means for this conflict, please. Well, what I've been saying for some time now, for, for many years, is um, you know, the, the global war on terror that the United States uh, waged for, for two decades uh, in the Middle East, um, it, it, it made us uh, the weakest we've ever been. And I'm not talking about because of what happened in Afghanistan and, and Iraq and in Syria. I'm talking about the fact that we used to have a military that was organized, trained, and equipped to wage large-scale ground combat using combined arms operations in, a, in any environment, whether it be Europe, the Middle East, anywhere, the finest military in the world, so that if we needed to, quote-unquote, shoot rabid dogs, we had the ability to do that. Um, instead, we took this military and we destroyed it in the Middle East. Um, we, we restructured it. We focused everything from recruitment all the way up to you know, how we organize, train, and equip um, focused on low intensity conflict um, and, and things of that, you know, counterinsurgency. The last thing we were training to do is carry out large scale combined arms operations. Um, and this means that our budgets were impacted, everything. So we stopped doing the things that are necessary and we lead by example. So all of NATO followed suit. You mentioned the British Army. It's not just that they're going to run out of ammunition. You know, there's large soccer stadiums in, uh, in Europe that can hold 100,000 people. Um, you put the entire British army in one of these soccer stadiums, you're going to have 30,000 unsold seats. Wow. It's not an army anymore. It's barely a core. They can't fight. They can't, they can't even get a brigade up and running. If the British were required to go to war today, they can't field a brigade. That's Unreal. the honest to God's truth. The Germans, in order to get a reinforced battalion battle group sent to Lithuania, had to cannibalize um, their armored brigades. Their brigades can't leave the barracks. This is all of NATO. NATO can't fight. And it's not just on the ground. It's in the air. An article just came out by the uh, Royal United Services Institute that talks about the, the fact that NATO's air force is decrepit, old airframes poorly maintained. It, you know, we run out of artillery ammunition. Uh, General Cavoldi, uh, uh, the, the commander of, uh, of U.S. forces in, in Europe, uh, also Supreme uh, Allied commander, gave a uh, presentation in January in Sweden where he said, you know, the scope and scale of what's going on in, in, in Ukraine today is beyond the imagination of anybody in NATO. He ba basically said, we didn't conceive of war of this intensity. We're not trained for it. We're not equipped for it. We're not prepared for this war. If we had to go into that war, we would lose. And one of the main reasons they would lose is because they have insufficient artillery ammunition. The Russians on a slow day are firing 20,000 rounds a day on a high day they're firing 60 to 80,000 rounds a day we produce 100,000 rounds a month um tells you right off the bat that we can't keep up with this um this this capability but it's not just yeah. artillery air to air you know we we want to send our air force in first of all our air force is not trained to do anything other than drop bombs on wedding parties and uh and and, and villagers i'm sorry i don't mean to be too blunt on that but that's all we've done uh, we haven't engaged in air-to-air -air combat. We haven't engaged in penetration operations against the world's most sophisticated integrated air defense, which the Russians have. And if we try to impose our power to project our air power into battle space controlled by Russian air defense, we would lose all of our aircraft. If we had to engage in air-to-air -air combat, we would run out of air-to-air -air missiles because we don't produce enough weapons to do that scope and scale that's taking place in, in Europe today. And this is all of NATO. NATO is a paper tiger. And the cost of trying to get NATO up to speed is astronomical, made even more so by what you just talked about, the high cost of energy. You know, how do you produce a tank? You need steel. How do you make steel? In a furnace. What powers the furnace? Natural gas. And if Man. it's so expensive, you can't afford to keep the, the 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 furnace up and running and it shuts down and that's what's happening in Germany right now. That's why a senior minister of their, of their defense uh, has said, "Don't give away these tanks because we can't afford to replace them. We can't afford to build the tanks necessary to replace them. Stop giving these tanks away." Um, that's just a statement of fact. NATO is a paper tiger. You know who's not a paper tiger? Oh, Russia. Yeah, Russia. <laughs> well, but but NATO is really great at fighting uh, via press releases. I mean, they 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 can 
they can whip up a mean word game, you know, that, that's, they can, they have, uh, you know, uh, linguistic artillery and they, they can catapult their propaganda that way very easily. But uh, I think versus kinetic real world Russian artillery, I, I don't think it holds up. But can I ask you a technical question about weapon systems? Sure. Um, the Russia, the, I think it's the Sarmat uh, 2 missile, or at least as it's called in the West, um, it is reputed to have, I think, uh, hyperglide reentry vehicles, uh, which can, uh, as I understand it, uh, this is my question to you, the, these can move at hypersonic speeds. They're, they're, they're guided, obviously. They can evade, so they have evasive maneuvers. And uh, is this system up and actually running at this point, or is it close to running? Or what, what do you think the real status is? Because it's hard to tell from, from Russia's official announcements. No, uh, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin has signed uh, orders bringing the Sarmat into full operational status. Now, that means that they have probably uh, fielded a, a regiment's worth of uh, missiles, maybe nine, um, you know, and, and, and they're still producing them. And as more missiles come on, they'll bring other regiments up. Uh, but right now, there's at least one regiment of, uh, of Sarmat um, heavy intercontinental ballistic missiles on operational duty right now, ready wow. to fire. And no, um, does the West have anything at all that can interdict that? Nothing. Uh, it, 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 it's it's a weapon that hits us two ways. First of all, almost all of our radars, early warning radars, and then the radars who, that that guide our ability to intercept missiles are focused on oriented towards the North Pole because when you take a look at a map, that's the shortest route to come out of the uh, Siberian uh, launch areas over the North Pole into the United States. Um, what the Sarmat does, because of its long range, it can fire and come th over the South Pole and come at the United States from behind where we have no absolutely way. nothing. So we wouldn't even know it was here until it hit us. And then the, the, to compound it, the problems is that it can deliver multiple avant-garde hypersonic um, you know, warheads. These can be either conventional or nuclear. Um, but the bottom line is, even if we did detect them, when they release these warheads, these warheads are not coming in on a normal ballistic trajectory. They will come in, they will, they're, they're powered, they'll maneuver, uh, oh. they'll change direction, they'll come down low, they'll pop up at the end, come down, hit the target. We can't stop them. And these are very accurate, very modern uh, warheads. So, and the reason why, and this is important for Americans to understand this, Russia didn't want to build this weapon. We made them build this weapon. You see, we're the ones that backed out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2002. We're the ones that fielded uh, ballistic missile defense systems in Poland and Romania and then lied about them, saying that the standard missile 3, SM3, can't shoot down ICBMs. And yet two years later, we deployed the standard missile 3, Block 2A, which is specifically designed to shoot down intercontinental ballistic missiles. We lied to the Russians. And Putin basically said, well, if that's what you're going to do, then we're going to build systems that defeat this. And he did that in 2018 when he announced these systems. He basically looked the Americans in the eyes and he said, we've been telling you for decades now not to do this. We, we've been telling you there will be consequences, but you didn't listen. Are you listening now? Yeah. And well, there it is. The avant-garde and the Sarmart uh, some are uh, uh, heavy, you know, heavy ICBM team. It's unbeatable, unstoppable. It's a game changer. It's a game winner. If we ever have a war with Russia, I can guarantee you this: we will not shoot down a single one of their missiles. And every missile they launch, their their warheads will hit their target, and you and I and everybody listening to this program will be dead. So that's that's terrifying uh, at many levels. But but also on the other side, what the U.S. launches at Russia. And, and my question to you is on this, but my understanding is that Russia has the most advanced anti-ballistic interdiction system in the world. I don't know if that, is that the SA-400 system that can be outfitted for even ICBMs or, or is it some other system? What, what, what's Russia's ability to stop our ICBMs from, from striking Russian cities? Uh, Russia has the S-400, which has a, a limited ICBM uh, capability, but they have the S-500. Wow. And uh, I think they got a system called the S550 uh, that that can do this as well. These are uh, advanced systems that are designed not only to shoot down, um, you know, uh, ballistic missile warheads, but um, for all the people that get turned on when they uh, when 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 they you know 
rolled out the B-21 Raider, the, you know, the new stealth bomber. And everybody was like, oh, my God, what a wonderful thing. Da, da, da. Uh, Russia's going to shoot that down, too. They have a system that can shoot that down. They'll shoot down the F-35s. They'll shoot down anything stealth we have. That's the problem with engaging in arms races. When you seek to acquire a technological uh, superior, superiority against a peer-level opponent, and um, I don't know what people think Russians do, but they have the most advanced research and development uh, programs for weaponry out there. Um, and when we take forever to roll out a system and we broadcast and advertise that we're rolling out this system, they have time to do what nations do, gather the intelligence and build the counter. So they have the counter deployed, ready, tested before we even get the system in the field. Yeah, so we don't want to go to war with these guys. Anybody who, who, who thinks that the Russians are stupid people, they are greatly underestimating the intelligence. And, you know, look, I, I, I interact with people from all over the world, and all the people that I've ever met from both Ukraine and Russia, by the way, are extremely high IQ. They're the best programmers, engineers, mathematicians, physicists. These are some of the brightest people on the planet. There's no question about it. And from both of those countries, by the way. So if, I mean, America is vastly underestimating Russia's weapons proficiency, I believe. And then if you look at who are the actual woke idiots in the world, it's in the U.S. Uh, State Department. You know, it's, it's, it's the U.S. administration right now. That's like a cabal of woke idiots, at least in my opinion. You may not use those terms, but that's what I think <laughs> is going on. Look, there was a, there was a time uh, during, the, uh, during the Reagan administration where we had adults. Um, the State Department was populated by adults. Um, my dog is, wants to be an adult. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, we, we, had, uh, we had cold warriors who cut their teeth on literally the beginning of the cold. I'll give you an example, a guy named Paul Nietzsche. Um, he wrote containment theory back in the early 1950s. He's the guy who came up with the National Security Directive uh, 68 which uh, created containment theory uh, for the Soviet Union. He was a cold warrior, and he ended up being the guy who negotiated the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the treaty that I helped implement in the Soviet Union. Uh, we had adults. We had people who knew the real world and, 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 and knew the risks that were contained in the real world and came up with solutions to these. Um, unfortunately, you know, the reason why Paul Nietzsche had all these skill sets is I, I liken them to muscles. He's a guy who actually went out there and, and worked out every day in the world of diplomacy and arms control and, uh, you know, national security uh, issues. So then when he sat down at the table, he was a strong man. Mentally, he knew what he was talking about. Today, we have people that don't exercise these these muscles. And so all their muscles have atrophied and uh, they're not nearly on the on the level of, uh, of, of a Paul Nietzsche or anybody of that caliber. We don't have those people today. If you want to call them woke, I don't know what they're what they call. I will call them totally ineffective. I will call them uh, inadequate to the task. And this is dangerous because we have forgotten uh, critical skill sets. We've forgotten how to negotiate in good faith. We've right. forgotten how to deal uh, in a in a reciprocal manner with um, with our counterparts. We're a nation that tolerates our president ordering an attack on an ally. We you know, tolerate that's... that. I, it's mind boggling. I say that's part just just to defend my use of the term woke. I think part of the woke worldview is that you make things change by wishing it. So even in diplomacy, they think, well, we're going to beat Russia by wishing it so or by issuing press releases. So the kind of the woke worldview is the view that doesn't take reality into consideration and doesn't understand cause and effect. And the I'm reality, not disagreeing with you. I'm not yeah. disagreeing with you on woke, but you, right. No, you I, I get it. My, I'm just uh, clarifying. My, my family, my my wife gets mad at me sometimes when I use certain terminologies, and <laughs> I have yeah. overused woke. Um, I probably share the exact same um, feeling you have regarding the term and how it should be applied. But um, my wife has asked me not to use that term. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I, I avoid it. Uh, you have the <laughs> anti-woke wife. Uh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's sympathy for, because believe me, my wife is uh, more anti-woke than I am. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. She's just trying to protect me. <laughs> uh, got it. Got it. No, it's good. It's good to have a wife that that's uh, helping to keep you safe, especially since you're on so many uh, kill lists and things like that. Right. So it's, I don't need it, the woke it, people coming after me too. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're going to have the wokesters coming after. Okay. Well, as we're, we're, we're 
we're running out of time here, uh, but last question uh, to you is about, you know, the so-called spring offensive. Now, I know Russia never officially announced there's going to be a spring offensive. Why would they? That's not what you do in, in the military. But there was a lot of speculation that there would be a, quote, offensive of some sort. But then again, the whole blitzkrieg approach doesn't seem rational from the way, you know, Russia is running its war. What, what do you think the, the, the near future holds for us, like the next couple of months? What are we looking at in Ukraine? Well, to get to the near future, uh, unfortunately, just the way my analytical brain works, we have to go in reverse for a little bit and understand how we got here. You know, this, this is a war that's been fought in several phases. The first phase, and I was one of the people early on that said, if Russia goes to war with Ukraine, it's going to be a blitzkrieg. It's going to be doctrinal. They're going to swamp the Ukrainians. This thing's going to be over in a week. Mark Miley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, shared that assessment. Uh, the, you know, William Burns, the director of the CIA, shared that assessment because had the Russians gone to war against Ukraine, they would have swamped them. This would have been over in a week. But Russia surprised everybody by not going to war against Ukraine. They carried out something called a special military operation. And the purpose of this wasn't to destroy Ukraine, but to compel Ukraine to the negotiating table. And we saw that three negotiations that took place in early March in the Belarus uh, city of Gomel, and then a fourth one scheduled for April 1st uh, in Istanbul, Turkey, where there was a treaty, a peace treaty ready to be signed. That was Russia's objective. So when everybody says, I, I believe Russia was doing this, that, and the other thing, you guys are all wrong. What Russia was doing in the initial phase of the operation was to get Ukraine to the negotiating table and to bring this conflict to an early uh, termination. But the United States and uh, Britain, uh, Boris Johnson, flew to Kiev and we killed it because we misinterpreted Russia's light approach to uh, this conflict as weakness. And so what we did is sought to extend the conflict. Now we roll into phase two, which Russia said, OK, if you don't want peace, then we are going to liberate the Donbass, the Lugansk and Donetsk. Uh, regions uh, where heavily populated by ethnic Russians. We're going to liberate that uh, and, and make them independent states. And they began this offensive operation that was grinding the Ukrainian army down. I mean, the Ukrainians have suffered horrendous casualties, and many of those casualties were suffered during this phase, from, say, May to August. But also during this phase, the United States and NATO provided Ukraine with tens of billions of dollars worth of modern military equipment, training, et cetera, support, and the Ukrainians were able to reconstitute uh, a force of about 70,000 troops, which they then used to launch an attack against overextended Russian flanks in Kharkov and Kherson. And that they drove them back. This was phase three, the vaunted counterattack. The Russians gave up territory to buy, uh, to preserve lives. They consolidated their lines. And then they go into phase four, which is having burned through the Ukrainian reserves, Russia now mobilizes. Uh, they go from their peacetime uh, you know, complement of 200,000 troops, and they mobilize 300,000 reservists. These are experienced veterans with specific military skills, and about 120 to 180,000 volunteers um, who are receiving similar training. And from September until today, these forces are being trained. Around 80,000 of them, uh, who had the guys who had most relevant experience. They were trained up as individual replacements, and they were sent in to solidify the lines to reinforce these units. The rest of them, over 300,000, are being trained in offensive-oriented, um, you know, tank-heavy uh, shock units. Um, and they're still training because the Russians aren't driven by the calendar. They don't care about Western propaganda. They don't care that Newsweek says there needs to be a winter offensive. They don't care that the Washington Post says there needs to be a spring offensive. The Russians care about results, and they will launch the offensive when they're ready to launch the offensive, once their troops are properly trained, equipped, and uh, logistically sustained. But the, the, the important thing is I believe the offensive has already started. Everybody's going, where's the big offensive? I said, have you seen what's going on on the battlefield? Look at Bakhmut. Uh, Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner uh, private military a uh, company, PMC, um, has straight up said, this is a man, he's pretty good at trolling on social media, but when he speaks, he speaks honestly. He speaks honestly about his own casualties, and he's spoken openly about the Ukrainian casualties. And he basically said, in Wagner's area of operations, from May until now, his troops have killed 110,000 Ukrainian soldiers. Gee. That's just in his area of operations. 
that means that numbers such as 300,000, 350,000 dead Ukrainians are not far-fetched. This has been a very bloody war. Um, and this is because the Russians right now are engaged in offensive operations all along the front. These aren't big arrow, you know, Operation Cobra type uh, stuff. This is putting pressure all along the front lines, forcing the Ukrainians to commit their last reserves, forcing them to, um, you know, use up precious ammunition, which they're running out of, by the way, and identifying the gaps, the weaknesses in the Ukrainian defenses so that when these other forces that are being finishing up their training, finally appear on the battlefield, they'll be able to identify the uh, desired courses of action that they want to pursue. Uh, the offensive has begun. It's called preparation of the battlefield, and the Russians will strike when the time is right for Russia to strike. Meanwhile, Ukraine is burning through everything. They're out there begging for tanks. Why? Because all their tanks have been destroyed. They're out there uh, hijacking men off the streets. Why? Because they're running out of people on the battlefield. They're begging for anything, a miracle from the skies, an F-16, something to come and save us. But Zelensky has said straight up, when asked, um, he, he said about American tanks, if I don't have these tanks and the numbers we need by August, it's all over. And well, all over and means Zelensky, Ukraine loses. He also just recently said that if Ukraine doesn't win this war, then America is going to have to send its young men and women to die in Europe. I mean, that's I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it's pretty darn close. No, he, 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 he just said, said that. That, uh, that disgusts me. Uh, first of all, regardless of where you stand on this, having a foreign leader talk about committing American um, you know, boys and girls into combat um, is unacceptable. And I don't know why the U.S. government hasn't stood up and, and told him what they should tell him, which is to sit down and shut up. Uh, mm -hmm. We alone make the determination about when. We send American forces in the harm's way, not you, Zelensky. You don't get to make that decision. You don't get to define that. You're not the engine that drives the American uh, war machine. But this man has been pumped up and, and has an artificial sense of, uh, of who he is because everywhere he goes, he's treated as a hero. Every word he says is treated. I mean, Nancy Pelosi uh, said of his speech when he spoke before a combined uh, House of, you know, combined, um, you know, uh, session of Congress, that it was the greatest speech ever delivered in the history of Congress. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, wow, so, really? You know, it, Cross-dressing like cocaine to, clown. That, that's amazing. Yeah, it's been likened to Winston Churchill. Uh, you know, so this man is apparently every, and, and he, he's now starting to believe it. But if you saw the videotape when he made that statement and you saw the desperation in his eyes, I mean, you know, we can joke about maybe he was high on cocaine. I don't know. But this was a man who is um, definitely unhinged. There yeah. was desperation. This was a, a, a nervous man because he knows it's over. He knows it's over. So he's yeah. doing anything necessary to get the support he believes needs. he needs to survive. And I have bad news for Zelensky. Um, go talk to the South Vietnamese and ask them what happened in 1975. Go talk to the Afghans and ask them what happened in uh in 2021. Go talk to the Kurds and ask them what's happening in the past, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and today. Um, we abandoned everybody we claim to be friends with. We're friends of nobody. And that's a sad statement, but it's a true statement. The United States will not be there for Ukraine in the end. We will abandon Ukraine uh, like we've abandoned everybody else when the going gets tough. When the going gets mm -hmm. tough, the United yeah, States- Yeah, far too many- too many lives lost. And uh, the one thing I want to see, and, and we're going to wrap this up, Scott, but but I think you agree with me on this. We we don't want to see people dying and, and we wish for, for safety and, and health and freedom uh, for all people in our world. And, and people like Zelensky are just getting his own Ukrainian citizens killed. And it's all being funded by the U.S. The blood of the Ukrainian men, are it's on our hands, America's hands, as much as Zelensky's hands right now. And it's a, it's a shame. 100%. The, the bottom line is everybody who sits there and say, well, I support Ukraine, therefore we need to give them more weapons. All you're doing is guaranteeing the further destruction of the nation, the further slaughter of, of Ukraine's men, the further uh, you know, dislocation of the women and children, uh, further destruction of infrastructure. All you're doing is guaranteeing that the Ukrainian nation you claim to support is going to die the most horrible kind of death. The best way to support Ukraine right now is to encourage the most the, the, the most rapid cessation of conflict, bring this war to an end. And the easiest way to bring this war to an end is stop pouring fuel on the fire. Stop sending 
weapons. Stop doubling down on stupid. Yeah. Okay. That's a great summary, Scott. I want to thank you for your time, but also give you an opportunity here. Uh, how, how can people follow you, give out your website, social channels, show names, things like that? Go ahead. Well, I think the easiest way to follow me is um, on uh, a website I've created called scottritterextra.com. Um, that's where I have a sub stack. There's no paywall on it, so you can access everything. If you want to support, that's your business. But everything I do, uh, for instance, if you send me a link to this show, that, that's going to be put on my Substack. Every podcast I do goes on the Substack. Every article I write goes on the Substack. So that's sort of a one-stop shop uh, for, for um, the work that I'm doing. Okay. All right. That, that's great. And um, you do, it's, it's almost, I think, a, a daily show that you do on Scott Ritter Extra. It seems like it, or almost I daily. It twice, I do it twice a week. Um, oh, okay. Maybe it, 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 but I, 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 like today, this is literally the... Um, sixth podcast i've done today <laughs> um, for you. <laughs> so it might seem like i'm doing a scott ritter extra every but i i try uh, uh, there's a lot of international interest so i've done uh, i've done a show for bulgaria today I, i've done a show for germany i did a show for macedonia <laughs> today so it's a uh, it's a diverse audience and now i'm doing one for uh, for the united states here with you well we thank you for your time and and uh, we hope for your safety and we also hope for for peace uh, as the outcome here, but but also the end of uh, tyranny, global tyranny that's being pushed, sadly, by um, right now the, the U.S. State Department. Got to reel them in and uh, re return to a world where we respect the rights of other nations to exist, I think. But that's just my take on it. But thank you, Scott, for joining me today. We really appreciate your time and your analysis. Thank you very much for having me, and thanks for your uh, your audience for listening. Uh, absolutely. All right, folks, that's it here on Brighttown.com. We're just speaking with Scott Ritter. And again, his website, I just mentioned, is scottritterextra.com. You can find him there, share his podcast. You'll also find a lot of his videos and interviews on Brighttown.com, which, is, of course, is a free speech video platform. And as always, feel free to repost this interview on other channels and other platforms. Just give credit to Scott Ritter. And thank you for watching today. I'm Mike Adams, also known as the Health Ranger here, the founder of Brighttown.com. God bless America. Thank you for watching. Take care. Thank you for watching. This platform is sponsored by HealthRangerStore.com. And if you're concerned about nuclear war or nuclear fallout, nuclear terrorism and accidents, I got to show you some solutions that we have. One of them is the Iosat potassium iodide tablets, FDA approved for preventing, of course, thyroid toxicity from radioisotopes. And then we have the nascent iodine as a dietary supplement can also be used topically. We have those available in the Health Ranger store. And you see the bucket there, uh, this bucket, this is a, a Zuki beans. That's one of the many mega buckets that we have available. Here, I'll show you what this looks like. The, these little red packets here, this is a brick of red lentils. And there's five of these bricks in the red lentil bucket. And there's multiple bricks in each of these mega buckets, so they're secured, vacuum packed for long term storage in a rugged rodent proof container. So if you want to get prepared for the possibility of nuclear war or nuclear terrorism, food and iodine and, you know, several other things would, of course, be critically important. But if you want to support us here at HealthRangerStore.com and support this platform, Brighttown.com, Go ahead and shop with us, healthrangerstore.com, lab tested, certified organic. We do more laboratory testing than anybody in the world. And we have these in stock in our warehouse and fulfillment center that we own and run ourselves in Central Texas, ready to ship. Check it out. Thank you for your support, healthrangerstore.com.